Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast. This week on the show, we are discussing trophy hunting, our big game record keeping system and its conservation underpinnings, and how all of this impacts our hunting culture. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Wired to Hunt podcast brought to you by First Light and its Camel for Conservation Initiative. And today we are wrapping up our series this month on the culture of our hunting community. And we've got a great one. We've got a couple guests here today that are going to help us explore one of the overarching issues that has hovered over much of this month's conversation. And that's trophy hunting and scoring deer and big bucks and all of that. And these are two folks who come to this issue from the perspective of the record keeping organizations, that being the Boone and Crockett Club and the Pope and Young Club. My guests today are Justin Spring, the executive director at the Pope and Young Club. He also sits on the Records and Ethics Committee for the Boone and Crockett Club. And then I'm also joined by Dr. John McRoberts. He is a research scientist and wildlife biologist professor at the University of Montana and the program administrator for the Boone and Crockett Wildlife Conservation Program at the University of Montana. And this whole conversation came together Um, in an interesting roundabout way that I'll describe in more detail once the two of them join me. Um, But I wrote an article discussing how I have questions about the role that our record-keeping systems and organizations play today, and if it's time to rethink that a little bit. And this all came from you know, kind of looking at these very issues that we talked about with Tony and Dan and Andrew about our community's obsession with antlers, obsession with score, all this one-upsmanship and this kind of just obsession over who's the better hunter, who's killed more big deer, whose deer's better than this deer, is this one better, is this guy better, yada, 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 and all of this social media chaos that stems from all that. And it, it got me to thinking, you know, why are we doing this? How is this helping us? Where did this all come from? which then sent me down a rabbit hole of trying to understand why were these record keeping systems invented in the first place? And what was the original reason for that? What's the historical impetus for this? And is all of this is, is the record keeping system and this idea of scoring deer and all of these things that have led us to glorifying trophy hunting. um, Is this achieving what those founders originally wanted for this system? Is this what we were supposed to be doing? Those are the questions that I had, and these questions led me to writing this article, and this article led me to get in touch with Justin Spring, who is the executive director, as I mentioned, of the Pope and Young Club. We bumped into each other at a show. We started having a great discussion on these very topics, which has all led us to where we are today and the conversation that I'm going to have here with Justin and John, in which we explore the history of our record-keeping system, how we got to this point. We discuss the conservation impetus, the ways in which our records and scoring deer and other critters was supposed to help with the conservation of wildlife. I'm going to ask these guys some questions about how that might still be going on today. Is it actually going on? Is that a thing? And is it concerning at all that I don't know the answer to that and that you probably don't know the answer to that? If that's why these record keeping systems were created, shouldn't it be important that we're aware of that? if it's still going on now? If so, how can we make sure that's more so the case? How can we make this whole thing more useful for conservation? Is there any way to take this whole scoring deer thing, which I think a lot of us believe has gotten out of control, what if we could kind of shift it around to not being a thing that's ranking hunters and who's the best hunter and who can post a picture on Instagram and get more likes? What if this could all lead to better conservation outcomes? for deer and elk and other wildlife. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? And how do we, you know, think about the implications of what this all means for our hunting culture? That is the set of questions and ideas that I discussed today with Justin and John. And I think it's a really interesting place for us to wrap up this series and uh, leaves me with some hope 
and intrigue for what the future might look like for these systems and for how we as hunters consider our trophies and how we partake in what might be a grand citizen science experiment if we let it be and if we participate in that spirit. So that's the plan for today. I really enjoyed this one. I think uh, you're going to learn some new things here and come to think about scoring deer, submitting your deer to record books, uh, all of that. I think we'll be thinking about it differently as well as the whole set of ideas around trophy hunting and uh, and much more there. So I'm going to stop rambling and trying to describe this thing and rather just let the conversation happen so you can see what it is for yourself. Enjoy this one. I hope you do too. Here we go. All right. Joining me now on the other side of the internet, I've got Justin Spring and John McRoberts. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today. Thank you. Appreciate you having us on. Yeah, I'm excited about this one uh, because I put you guys in the closing part of the lineup. We've had a full month now discussing various aspects of our hunting culture. And that's a fairly ambiguous uh, thing to consider. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, but I feel like your roles with the Boone and Crock Club and Pope and Young put you in touch with a lot of these topics we've been chatting about here. Everything from trophy hunting and antler scoring and fair chase, ethics, um, technology, gear use, science and conservation and the intersection of those things with the management of wild game and hunting regulations and all that kind of stuff. This is very much uh, the world we've been exploring and very much the world I know that the both of you exist in. So, so first and foremost, thanks for making the time to, to join me on this and to kind of dive into this set of topics that's not always easy to get into. Um, but the original kind of connecting impetus for this, as you both know, uh, came from an article I wrote. And this article was titled, It's Time to Rethink Big Game, excuse me, Big Game Record Keeping. And this whole thing, I don't think I've shared with you guys this, but this whole thing came about because I was asked to write about a particular buck story that had come out a few months earlier. Um, and a guy had shot a world-class whitetail and then he had gone and had it scored by this organization and that organization and this organization. He thought it was going to be the number two um, typical buck shot with a bow or I can't even remember the specifics now, but he thought it was going to be a number two buck in certain rankings. And then each different organization had some different reason there nitpicking it apart. And I found myself talking to him and going through all the details and I, I, I got bored with it. And I got, I got to thinking like, why am I spending all this time? Why is anybody spending all this time nitpicking over if this buck certain tine is an abnormal tine or is it a shared base or is it this thing or that thing like why is the story about this deer about whether it's this score or that score why isn't the story about just this person's incredible experience or about the landscape that produced this deer or about the time he shared with his family afterwards i, I personally have just become so sick of this inches above all kind of thing that sometimes we fall into. And I collectively, like I consider my par myself a part of that sometimes. Like I, I've been guilty of that too. And so that's what kind of sent me down this weird rabbit hole that the article became. The article became kind of nothing about that guy's specific buck. It became all about, you know, what else is there when it comes to this whole scoring thing? What was it originally here for? Why did we develop a scoring system? What was that all about? Um, and are we living up to that original impetus? And the, the very, very cliff notes version of which I'm going to ask for the both of you to chime in with a little bit more detail, but the, the original kind of starting point for all this came from with the founders of the Boone and Crockett Club looking at this as a, as a conservation project. 
in that we were trying to recover these species, many, many different species across the nation that had come to the, the cliff's edge of extinction in many cases. We are now realizing like, hey, we need to recover these species. And how do we keep track of whether or not that's happening? How do we keep track of if we are seeing success? What kinds of, um, how do we track and measure indicators of the fact that maybe we're doing this in some kind of way? So they started these record keeping systems in those early years and there was this idea of using this data set to support future conservation efforts. Good data leads to good science, leads to good work on the ground, and better population management, I think, was where that started. And so I then spent, you know, another 500, 800 words asking questions about, is that still happening today? Is that how we're using this now? Or has it just become, you know, a way for hunters to argue amongst themselves about who's the better deer hunter, who's killed more 200 inch deer, who's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I feel like that's like a, a, a letdown or a, a underutilization of the opportunity we have. So I posted that article, went out there into the world and Justin, at some point you saw it or somebody sent it to you. And then a few weeks later, you and I bumped into each other at the Western hunt expo had a great had a great conversation about these things. This is all a very long <laughs> rambling setup <laughs> to why we are all here today because I'd like to get your perspective the both of you on some of those questions that I had coming out of that little bit of soul searching that I had when I was working on that piece. Um, so the first thing I'm curious about and, and maybe Justin if you want to kick us off here the first thing I'd love to hear straight from you is a little bit more about the genesis of this whole thing. Yeah. Right. Um, how did we get here with this record keep, keeping system, the set of systems that we have here today? And what were those original goals for them? So to start with, you know, the system was redevised in 1950. Um, but we'll get to that. I'll start from the very beginning. You know, we go back to 1893, I believe, was the first sportsman's exposition in New York that Theodore Roosevelt was a judge on, you know, looking at, um, at the time, what was the best trophy, right? Hunting wasn't as common. And so from the very beginning of the organization, they were interested in, in the top specimens. You know, they, they figured out, like, the, the scoring was very basic. Man, that one has a real nice G2 plus five points. Oh, I don't like the color, color of this, negative two. So they could see right away, like, man, this this whole judging of an animal off of somebody's criteria doesn't work. At the same time, they completely felt that all wildlife was going extinct. Uh, and, and they weren't wrong at the time. Um, 1906, the club started making or started um, compiling the national collection of heads and horns. And so even in your article, you mentioned the 1906 book. That was a field journal that the club kind of put together to, for hunter, it wasn't a, it wasn't a scoring per se. It was more of a, a journal of, hey, I took this animal. Here's some useful measurements that may be able to be used. So in the beginning, they were trying to find the best of every specimen to save for our generation, thinking that no big game was going to be available. So that that's the very beginning of Boone and Crockett. That that ties to your trophy hunting to where populations couldn't sustain harvest on young and females. So looking for only the oldest, most mature animal was was the way that hunting could continue. Um, you know, if you read articles from back then, people are apologizing to the public if they took a second moose in their lifetime. You know, we'll we'll get into this later, but I think that there's a lot to say that the fact that we can go shoot three or four deer every year is so much different than what these guys were facing. So anyway, that was the beginning from 1906 to 26. I believe we compiled this national collection of heads and horns. They were looking for the best specimen for the future. Well, we get into the twenties and thirties, you start having wildlife conservation take off Pittman Roberts and all the efforts of the organization early on towards conservation. And this, this uh, collection was in the Bronx zoo. Well, as wildlife populations recover, um, people don't want to go see heads hanging in a museum anymore. They can go to Yellowstone now. They can go to these parks and see these animals. So it kind of fell out of fell out of circulation, and they closed down the exhibit. Well, the club saw these conservation successes, and they're like, "Man, how can we track that? Like, how do we how do we ensure that you know what we're doing right is recognized, and what we're doing not doing correctly is recognized?" 
So this is when this group of guys sat down to develop the scoring system that we have today that's now criticized on, oh, is it perfect? Is it this? Is it that? They took every species and they said, what is the typical form? What is the common form of this animal? Um, you know, they, they took the best science at the time and said, you know, um, bilateral symmetry, massiveness, those are the traits of the healthiest specimens. What is a typical, for example, white-tailed deer look like? Well, it's got, you know, a main beam with, with tines that come off equally spaced, roughly matched off the outside of the beam all the way out. So they, they decided what the common or typical form of each animal was or specimen was, and that's what that score was based around to, you know, go to where we are today. And so it even, even in the beginning, it kind of changed. I mean, to your point of how do we go forward, you know, there, there's things that we can improve on for sure, but that's that's how we got this system now that's, that's so heavily criticized on deductions and this and that. And there's my long rambling answer to your question. <laughs> no, that's that's great. So so the I think there's there's something that folks are always curious about. And you mentioned there a little bit the fact that there's there's a lot of criticism around you know, nets are for fish, right? Folks don't like deductions. Folks don't like the fact that we don't give the deer credit for abnormal points, for non-typical points, for all that kind of stuff. Um, so I just want to reiterate something you said and then ask maybe if you can add on if there's anything else I'm missing here. The, a key point is like the, the scoring system that was put in place was put in place because it should be documenting and, and points to the healthiest deer. So the idea being we are looking for indicators of health and historically abnormal points or asymmetry was indicative of poor health, correct? So, some form of stressor generally, and John can touch on this a little more. He's looked at the research, but most of what you know would be considered a deduction is, is caused by some stressor, be it, you know, pedicle damage, bug bites, you know, who, who knows what it can be. But, you know, in at the time, that was why they were looking for those symmetrical massiveness trophies. And, John, you want to touch on that from what you've seen in today's research? Yeah, I will, Justin. And so Justin mentioned bilateral symmetry. When we get into atypical antlers, uh, the term that, that folks might want to look into a bit more is fluctuating asymmetry. And that's what a lot of the research is based around. And that's not only in antlers, that's in humans, that's in biomedical research. And so the idea is that's a proxy for ev environmental or genetic stressors of some kind. Now, those could be you know, parasites, injury, disease, density-dependent issues. And so I've heard the criticisms too. But when the scoring system was developed, it was separate the typical, the bilateral symmetry, from the asymmetric. And so that's where those classifications came from. And uh, there's more to the story uh, that we've seen this research done on, on fluctuating asymmetry, taking it a step farther, it's what about female choice? Are females really selecting for either bilateral symmetry or selecting against asymmetry? And so there's, there's more to the story but the important thing is with treating this as a scientific data set which which we should explore more consistency in methods and how you score and how you classify makes this data set a lot more powerful and and so there is some value into keeping the scoring system as it's been yeah so that that perfectly segues to the next kind of side of this i i'm, I'm curious to learn a, a little bit more about um, as we kind of talked about earlier, I can't remember if this was before we started recording or after we started <laughs> recording, um, but it seems like within the realm of the general public, um, when I think about the Boone and Crockett record books, or I think about the Pope and Young record books, um, I only ever hear those things referenced and brought up. I only ever hear score brought up when it comes to, oh, my buck was this big, but your buck was only that big, or this is a top 10 buck, or this is a new state record buck, or this is going to be the new world record buck, or, uh, you know, this guy's killed five, 200 inches. He's better than you or whatever it is. Um, that's the only time I'm ever hearing scoring and record keeping brought up in, in general conversation with your average deer hunting buddy of mine. 
No, you're. But it sounds like. Sorry, just one, just one more thing. Um, but from what you were saying, Justin, it doesn't seem like that was ever brought up by Mr. Theodore Roosevelt or George Bird Grinnell or Hornaday or anybody back in the early 1900s when they were, you know, co-founding the Boone and Crockett Club and this record-keeping system. Uh, it was it was not to confirm who the best hunters were or who has the most 200-inch deer or whatever. It was to create a scientific data set to help with conservation efforts, right? Yeah. Can you can you speak a little bit more to the ways in which the data set has been used or was hoped to be used? Because um, I think that's a, that's an important thing for us to understand is is are these records are is this whole idea of measuring antlers is this to tell who's the best dang hunter or is this to do something better for the future of wildlife? No, I mean it's it's interesting you bring it up that the only time you hear about it is is the next world record or the biggest this or biggest that. I can honestly say I, I didn't go into this this line of work and conservation and scoring or anything because it was about ranking hunters. It was about the conservation, you know, and I'd always try to tell we had a marketing team at Boone and Crockett. How do we get folks to check out our page? How do we get them to join? You know what always fell flat? The thing that excited me the most, like this county just put in a deer that just made the book. We've never seen this county put out a 160 before. It got nothing. You put out there, hey, potentially the largest typical killed in Ohio by a female, millions of likes, right? And so you're not wrong. What you see is what people want to see, I guess, is lack of the, for lack of a better term. We, we tried to push it out. We tried to tell the conservation story. This is why I love getting on a podcast like this with, you know, your listeners and whatnot is explain this was not what it was ever. It was never supposed to rank the hunter. Um, you know, one thing I always tell folks and they, oh, nets are for fish, all that, man, if we were looking to recognize hunters, we would have used gross score. We're looking to recognize conservation. So that's why that net score, that symmetry, all that comes into play. And so, you know, the, the group that started this, we never wanted somebody having a hunt made or braid, you know, made or broken by a number that was attached to an animal. That was never what we wanted. I mean, there's areas in the country that, okay, you're not going to get as big of an elk in this area. That number tells you that. It's not that you're less of a hunter, that it's not as good of a trophy. It's, you know, biologically, why do the elk in this state not grow as big a G4 as the elk in that state, you know? And yeah, I, we're as frustrated with it as you are, and we don't disagree with the prob- you know, the problems of, of folks making everything about that final number and not about everything else that goes into it. Yes. Yeah, so, so what's what's the alternative of the record keeping system? That being like, can you give me some examples of how this data set that we have right now is being used for conservation? Because I think the average person maybe is thinking like, I don't see how a bunch of antler scores helps conservation. Um, could you get? Could you guys share some you examples? You know, I know that the, the state of Idaho was looking at a particular one of their biologists was looking at an area and felt that the deer were getting smaller. They took our data and compared it with some stuff they were doing to see if it matched. Um, Oh, Arkansas, I believe, put in an antler point restriction and they saw some trends in their harvest data that they then got B and C data to see if it matched what they were seeing. If we were seeing it at our level as well, um, there was a wildlife monographs, uh, Monteith et al., that that was done by a group of, of professors that are associated with the club that looked at over time was hunter selection potentially causing big game animals to get smaller. You don't hear about a lot of this in the, the, the you know, social media or that world because it's pretty in-depth research. Um, John, do you have other good examples? Those are the ones that come to mind for me. Yeah, there's other peer-reviewed literature. And, and in a university setting, that's, that's everyone's currency is doing this research that goes out for review by your peers is – flaws are looked for so that that paper won't be published. That's how the system worked. And there's a number of papers in premier wildlife journals, like the Journal of Wildlife Management, the Wildlife Society Bulletin, the Journal of Mammalogy, that have used this data set as a variable to comment on what goes into antler productivity from soil minerals to land use type to edges to habitat connectivity. And so there's a number of studies that takes 
the information that was recorded on that score sheet aggregates it across the U.S. and can produce the highest quality research. The other way that the scoring system is commonly used is if antler measurements or horn measurements are used as a covariate of some point in in someone's analysis. And so th- this this isn't technical, and it's just instead of taking a measurement, say, hind foot length, they can use the BNC score to help generate conclusions. Uh, and and so those are some of the top tier, I'd call them, research outputs from this, from this data set. But about this time last year, Justin and I had an email from a college senior at the University of Wisconsin who wanted to do his senior thesis project on um, whitetail antler scores and relate that to climate, to land use type, land cover. And so this is a study that never gets published, but it helps helps this young man graduate. Presumably he's a hunter. And so uh, it, it kind of comes full circles of citizen science hunters helping generate management and conservation output. And so in the beginning, Mark, you ask if the science is still happening. It most definitely is. I mean, this is still a a nationwide long-term data set. We just probably need to do a better job advertising that that's how it can be used. Yeah, it it seems like it's it's ripe for opportunity. Like it's it's almost an underutilized resource or or let let me rephrase this. Uh, an analog or an alternative community that I've seen do something really, really neat with a citizen science initiative like this would be the burden community, mm-hmm. right? There's the burden community and they have the eBird app in which they have birders from all across the world documenting every bird they see and where they saw it. And this has become something that is an exciting opportunity to participate for the birder. And then it also helps lead to a data set, which is of unbelievable conservation value to researchers and managers trying to understand how bird populations are doing across the nation, the impacts on the environment, environmental impacts on bird populations, et cetera. Um, We have a similar set of invested users in hunters who are out there doing something. In, In our case, we're not necessarily documenting a sighting. We are able to document a harvest or a kill. And we have a data point every single time we kill an animal. Um, and so I see the Boone and Crockett record books, the Pope and Young record books. This is like, it, it's, it's collecting a micro slice of the data out there. And I'm just curious if there is an opportunity for more. Like, is there an opportunity for there to be greater participation from the hunting public in this if it were to be framed as a citizen science opportunity and not a, hey, get yourself in the record book so you can, you know, be a, a big bad hunter that killed a Boone and Crockett buck? Um, is there any opportunity for, it di- for looking at record keeping in the hunting world in that kind of way? Is there an argument to be made, a pitch to be made to the average hunter out there that's like, hey, man, you should submit your buck to Boone and Crockett or to Pope and Young, even if you don't care if you're in the top 50 for the state or not, just because like, hey, this is good for conservation. This is good for science. And if that is the case, are there any changes we can make to how we do this so that that data is even more variable or more thorough? John, do you have thoughts on that or Justin? I think we uh, it's spot on. I mean, if we could expand the scope of this data collection, it'd be all the more powerful. Interestingly, you mentioned eBird. I mean, that's that's tied with the internet. But prior to that, it was the North American Breeding Bird Survey, which came online or came about in the mid '60s. And so, interestingly, this data set has 15 years on one of the oldest beyond there. I think that it would be fantastic to message that exact need to the hunting community. I mean, the more data from that we can collect with this data set, the more powerful the conclusions will be. Yeah. 
What are your What are your thoughts you know, on that, Justin? We we spent a good time amount of time talking about this in Utah. No, I I think the the more data we can collect, the better. Um, when I was when I was at Boone and Crockett, we've got many states have a state level organization that's collecting data with a lower minimum uh, score. If if we can tie that together with, you know, Boone and Crockett's data, that increases our data um, data set size. The one issue that we have, you know, with being too much citizen science is the way that Boone and Crockett set this up is that each person that does the scoring is trained. It's a five day workshop. And so there is a standardization of the data that we we can look at that data. It's all been reviewed. They've all been trained the same way. So we have specific people. That's where it gets a little bit problematic to really blow this up to where everything gets scored and, and taken care of is having those official measures that that have been taught how to do this, the correct methodology and whatnot to get it. Um, but we are always looking for, you know, the, the example I give, and I hear heard this a lot and still do, is that, well, I have one in the book, but it's bigger, so I don't want to put this one in. When we're looking at trends, man, one smaller than the one that you killed before is just as valuable as one bigger. You know, we don't only, I mean, we're, we're defensive as hunters, but man, we, we don't only want to just show the positive. We want everything. I mean, how many people have said, oh, there used to be, you know, deer 10% bigger in this county up until this happened? Well, you know, these these record books, Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett, we're the only ones that have the data that can really check that and say, is that, you know, the case? Or did they move? Did they change, hab- you know, did they change selectivity of where they're, where they're living? Are we seeing them now more on edge where they used to be timber? And so every single data point, if it makes any book, be it State or, or Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett or all of the above, I think it's very important to put them all in. And, and if you're fortunate enough to, you know, find yourself in a situation to harvest one that meets those minimums. I mean, 40 bucks, 35 bucks, whatever the state fee is versus Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett, that's a, that's an investment in conservation. You know, and I, I always try to tell folks like, don't, don't worry if it doesn't make all time. Don't worry. It, it's a data point that we need to see for us to do our mission, you know, and we'd love to have you participate. So I, I, I think there's a huge call for it. You know, it's just we we have we can't we can't throw the data out that we've built. We just how do we expand on what we've had to make it a more robust data set without losing quality? So so then why not remove the minimum score? Why can't I kill a hundred? Why isn't my hundred and ten inch five and a half year old buck that I killed off of a fresh clear cut in southern Michigan a useful data point? for future conservation efforts? hundred percent is. It's just the, the the feasibility of maintaining all that. That's why, you know, Boone and Crockett said, we can't keep track of every animal taken. So how do, how do we extrapolate? Okay, let's, let's take the very top tier, right? We know if they've reached this minimum score, which is why we don't look for the biggest every year. We're just saying, hey, if it hits this level, everything had to be in place for it to get there. So, in that case, we can't say, oh, the problem is this or the problem is that. What we can say is, historically, we were seeing this many meet this threshold. Now we're seeing less or now we're seeing more. From a single organization, we had to limit what we could look at just to maintain our integrity and make sure we were doing it correctly. So we did not have the ability to take everything that was 105 inches or better. But yes, it'd be great data if we if we could get folks to support us to the point where we could drop minimum scores and record more, that that's the ideal world for data collection. Yeah, I, I could. If 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 money wasn't an object and he had all the support staff <laughs> and and funds to do it, man, it does. I I wish that was the case. I wish that we could reframe this as like, hey, like let's all participate in getting the best possible data that is because 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 data provides the foundation for all management decisions it right <laughs> and and if we can as hunters can right <laughs> right uh we hope it does and and what a great opportunity for us as hunters to be a part of that um like i would i would love to be a part of that i would like i've, I've zero desire to be on a list that shows how i rank with other hunters but i have tremendous desire to contribute to a more positive future for whitetail deer or elk or whatever it might be. And I think there's a lot of hunters out there today that feel that way. Um, I kind of feel like 
the market of hunters who want to be in a list and ranked, that's saturated. Like those folks who are going to participate in that, that they've cut, like they've done it. They're there. They know how to get their name in there and they've been in their bunch. There's this whole other blue ocean of hunters who don't care about that or who are sick of hearing about that, who would love to participate though in this side of things. How, what, what opportunity is there for that kind of person to get involved given the limitations that you're talking about, Justin? You know, I mean, the one thing is we, we hear, we hear a lot of this. you heard a lot of it at BNC. We actually change the rules where if you submit all your information to Boone and Crockett, you still don't have to have your name listed in the book. You can put your trophy in anonymously. We never had anybody do it. And so maybe it it wasn't out there enough, but man, people worry a lot about, oh, I don't want to give up my hunting spot. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. You know, it's really hard for me trying to talk to somebody, oh, I'm a conservationist, you know, put that in. You've got 15 deer that are on the wall that over time, you know, you could show a a trend, you could show something, you know, get those scores, get those entered. If you want to be more involved in the citizen science, both Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett are always looking for official measures. Um, You know, sign up to to come to a course and, and, and learn about the system, learn about, you know, what we're doing, and then be one of the representatives for these organizations out there you know, getting those deer, digging those deer out of garages, talking to people, getting the stories, you know, that's how we build this out. And and you're right. I mean, the Boone and Crockett went with the classic bait and switch. Hey, be part of our cool club, enter your deer, and you can be in this book. Well, we were getting the data. It was a classic bait and switch. We're very good at getting those guys that want to be on the list. And it's cool. I mean, hey, I've got a number six mountain goat in Oregon, you know, whatever it may be. That's a cool thing. But man, the guys you're talking about that don't really care about the list and just care about the future, they're just as important. And so that, you know, that's why John and I are here is is to talk to you and, you know, kind of plead this case of, you know, this is why everybody should participate. And it's not about, you know, ranking and and this and that. It's never been. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's a great reminder because I I think most of your average hunters and, and, speaking from like my own world I'm in and the people I talk to, I don't think any of my friends would ever think about submitting their deer to the record books because Mm -hmm. of what we're talking about. Um, But when they hear this and they realize like, Oh, Hey, you know what? Actually there, there's something more to it than just like this ego thing. um, Then I I bet you there will be a bunch of my friends who would be much more interested in doing it, recognizing like, Oh, this is something that actually might help. Um, I, yeah, it's not that doesn't take that much time. I can do that. Um, that all said, though, when making this case that the record books and having our deer scored um, contributes positively to future conservation efforts, it, it seems to me that if we're trying to accumulate this wealth of data that can be used to make better decisions in the future, um, it seems like the data is, is, is so thin. Like there's so much more I wish we could get. And you mentioned this consistency of data, John. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had questions in that piece. Like why, why can't we pull a tooth and make sure that every submission has a tooth so we can get an accurate age on that deer? Why can't we have some level of more location, um, fidelity so we can tie these, uh, these data points back to better location sets so that we can have you know, more granular location related correlations and trends? Why can't we have something like weight of the animal or, or any other biometric data to make sure this is more than just an antler score thing. It gives us a better picture of animal health, which should give us a better picture of environmental health, which should give us a better data set for conservation decisions. Um, Can we not add new data categories to these record books? You first of all, you hit on the top two that I'd love to see, and that's location and age. And BNC now voluntarily asks for an incisor that can be aged, but it seems like that's a tall order from some hunters to to submit that. And so, requiring it where where it was all or nothing, I think we'd end up losing data points that still have great value. And Justin hit on the location thing. Uh, so 
folks just don't want to give out their location. And I kind of get that. I mean, we're coming on to spring and I don't think I'd give away my best morale location for science. And <laughs> so that's, that's just the reality of what we're in. That said, if more people could voluntarily give a lat long and could pull a tooth, the power of the conclusions that we could draw from this data set would skyrocket. And so it would be great. It would be great to have that. The only reason why I think it's prohibitive is just the likelihood of hunters submitting it right now is, is not entirely high. You know, and from both organizations, you know, we've done everything we could trying to get an age. BNC pays for it. I mean, it takes a while. We have to get a hundred teeth, I think was the old deal for, for them to get the the break, but if somebody wanted to submit a tooth, we'd say, hey, once we got to 100, we'll submit these, we'll add that. Um, there is certain categories of the data that do have tremendous age data associated. Sheep comes to mind because they're all checked in. And so there's that standardized aging of rams that is all held in the data set. Now we don't publish that, but that is there. Um, location data, we would always take as much as they would give, but we just never publish more than county. It varies from hunter to hunter. Some guys would send in a GPS coordinate, like literally down to the spot it was taken. We recorded that. That's in the data set. So if somebody requests the data and they want to look at location, that was there for them. We just never made that publicly available, you know, to where the general public could see, hey, this this guy killed this deer or this gal killed this deer at this particular spot. Um, in terms of the weight, it would be very useful, but that goes back to the in the 50s and the 60s when this was developed, and that was the the 60 day drying period. It was the standardization. You know, some people were a month in the mountains and they had to, you know, it's not fair that somebody could shoot this animal and get it scored that day, and the other guy had to wait a month till he got out. So they put in this 60 day drying period to kind of standardize it. That would be the issue with the weights, as we don't. Not that there couldn't be a system developed, but right now we don't have a standardized, here's how Boone and Crockett collects the weights of animals. Um, they did do research at one point on moose racks to see if the, if the mass of a moose rack varied in different areas. And so for a while, there was actually a diagram on the score chart that said, okay, was it, was it the whole skull? Was it cut narrowly? Was it cut in the middle? And so it kind of shows you some of that variation you get in trying to add a, a data data point. Well, how much skull is cut in the middle in John's opinion versus mine? And so that's why some of those factors that would be super awesome, just over time, we never had the ability to implement, you know, due to variation that kind of shot holes in the, the validity of the measurement. And with the weight thing, when we're, let's say we're out collaring deer or elk or antelope or whatever, weight isn't a common variable that we'll collect. I mean, it has some use, but having age class data, that can take you a lot farther with, with management implications. So John, from you know being so involved on the science side of things, if you had an unlimited budget, if, if we could guarantee that BNC or PNY had an unlimited budget and all the staffing they could ever ask for, and you were tasked with renovating the record keeping system so that this could be the absolute best tool for future conservation needs. Mm -hmm. In a time when we are probably going to have greater conservation needs than ever, as the human footprint on the world continues to expand, as, as so many different factors change environmentally over the next 50 to 100 years, I think it is you know, not an exaggeration at all to say that we are, you know, going to be faced with all sorts of difficult choices and um, unforeseen circumstances in coming decades, right, for wildlife. So we need the best tools that we possibly can have heading into that future. So if you were tasked with uh, creating this 2.0 system, that would be that tool for the future. Again, budget, staffing, None of it's of a concern. Unlimited. Please tell me what that perfect 2.0 system would look like. Well, I wouldn't do much to change the measuring of antlers and horns because I, I, I think that's pretty well covered. I would have an ultrasound and collect rump fat. If it's a dead animal, I'd collect bone marrow condition and quantity in the upper femur. It'd be good to pull a lymph node to get a clearer idea of CWD distribution. Of course, get the tooth, get the location, and 
those are the first couple that come to mind. And with that information on every potential animal that's harvested, you'd have a, a out of this world data set, but that take an unlimited budget. <laughs> yeah. And so you would, you would, you would ask for the, every animal harvested, no minimum score. Is that correct? Um, if you could get it, every animal that was harvested, that was roadkill, that was anything, anything that someone could get their hand on. And yeah, that'd be, that'd be the dream data set. Yeah. Okay. Now let's say that, uh, <laughs> Your boss came in and established a budget. <laughs> and uh, the, the real world is back in play. You have, you have the, the real set of limitations we have in this real world. What, is, what are two changes that you would make if you had the ability to make two changes to our system or, or, or you know, the data we're trying to collect? Mm -hmm. Um, what would those two changes or asks be within the set of limitations that we know we have? Well, something that would be that would be very feasible, and it it loop in it it require looping in some statistician and some population modelers. But um, the amount of effort, number of days, number of hours that somebody was hunting for a particular animal, and this. It's easy to think of this on a micro scale where you know where this big white tail is on the back wood lot, but how much effort went into that? Because knowing those hunter effort metrics that result in harvest can really help uh, with population forecasting. And then again, I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but age goes a long, long way. Knowing what the age class is for that population would be valuable. Um, most of the animals that would make well, the BNC book that would come back to us are older animals. And so uh, having, there's ways where you can get proxies for a you know, year and a half versus two and a half. That's really not applicable here. And so pulling that tooth would be the most reliable way. And if you had that, you'd be in very good shape. Yeah. So Justin, um, being in the, the leadership role that you are there with PNY and, and understanding your own limitations and having your previous experience with BNC, um, if you could snap your fingers now and and either take one of these suggestions that John had or or make a change of, of your own desire, what would you like to see change um, or be updated or renovated in some kind of way to, to improve this citizen science opportunity? You know, just just participation. I mean, that is is a leadership role. I mean, anything's you know, if if all of a sudden we started getting a hundred percent of the animals that were taken that made Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young, if everybody was participating at that level, we'd have the funding to go bigger. You know, if if age again, age has been a reoccurring theme. I I spent fifteen years at BNC trying to figure out how to up that age data. I mean. I got to play with the data. It was a lot of fun because we'd have teeth that had replacement and wear ages. We had bio, um, oh, bio, you know, tagged animals, so known age. And then we also had uh, the the section tooth data and I could compare them, you know, and I, I can tell you a lot of, a lot of whitetail hunters want to call their Boone and Crockett deer four and a half. And mo most of them aren't, um, you know, that, that kind of shows some of the, some of the hiccups of going too much citizen science. So, you know, like I said, I, to John's point, yeah, I'd love to add a couple traits. Honestly, there's probably a couple small changes I'd make on the scoring. Um, just, just because having done it for so long being like, man, I don't understand why they made that rule the way they did. But again, they've been doing it for, you know, 80 years. You can't really throw out 80 years of data just because there's a better way to take a G1 on a bull elk. Yeah. Okay. So I think a, a reasonable ask for the audience then, it sounds like, would be participate a little bit more in this. If you previously thought this was not for you because you don't care about how you're ranked within the list of other hunters who killed a 170-inch buck or whatever it is, um, there's a science, there's a conservation reason to do this. There's value in submitting the thing and submitting as, as, as thorough of a, of a uh, submission as you possibly can with all the data you're willing, because the more data, the better. And, and let's all do the age. 
let's throw in the voluntary age opportunity. Let's check that box because it sounds like that's going to be very valuable data. And then if we all do this, if we all do a really good job of participating more, then Justin's going to have the funds to be able to take more of these submissions and maybe 10 years from now, we'll have a case to be made to lower the minimum uh, scoring threshold so we can have more folks participate or add on um, one of these other asks that John made. Um, so that's this is a step in the right direction maybe, right? That's right. And the other thing, I mean, we, participation is key. Uh, I've deer hunted most of my life. I grew up in Missouri around big deer. I've never killed a deer that approached 160. I know people who do every season and I hound my friends and encourage strangers to submit because there is value in this. And so even if you're not the one that made the harvest, communicate to people who do how much this can benefit conservation by hunters. I mean, it's kind of that positive feedback like we'd see in PR dollars and buy in duck stand. This is a way for hunters to step up and benefit conservation. Yeah. So, so we, I, I also want to pick both of your brains about the flip side of this conversation, which kind of ties back to the original thing that my article started with, which was the obsession with antlers and antler score that many have within their community and that I have been guilty of at times too. And there's nothing wrong with being excited about big deer. I love big deer. I love big elk. They're fascinating, amazing critters, and I get a charge out of chasing them. Um, but there are definitely some downsides to what this has done to our community and, and culture as well. Not to mention the fact that uh, survey after survey after survey shows that the non-hunting public, those that are the majority, that have the voting power to determine our fate, uh, are very strongly telling us for decades now that they are not supportive of trophy hunting. Um, so there seem to be some risks that come alongside of the continued promotion of antler score, antler size, that kind of thing. Justin, with your role at a company or an organization, you know, that has been a part of this record keeping for decades now, how do, how do you personally think about this? Do you, do you have any worries about our infatuation with antlers? Do you not? Do you see negatives or concerns around it? Are you not worried about it? Um, from a cultural perspective, from the impact of what this says about us as hunters or where hunting is going, um, where are you personally at with all that? Uh, you know, obviously the majority of my job, um, the promotion of, of a lifestyle, a promotion of archery, a promotion of records keeping of the conservation model that's been around forever. You know, the success of my job is dictated by having the buy-in of that 72% of the country that doesn't hunt themselves but approves of it. And so if we're doing something that that 72% finds offensive, there's two ways to deal with that. Either we come together as a group and say, hey, we, we just got to knock it off because they don't like it. Or we have to say, hey, we got to fix our act here a little bit and explain to them why pursuing that oldest, biggest, most mature animal in some situations is what you should do. In other situations, when we're trying to lower the uh, the the density of deer, maybe we, maybe we shouldn't be shooting those bucks and putting in all that effort. Maybe we should be killing five or six does. And so... I do think that this over this infatuation, this this do anything for the big deer is problematic. And, and we have examples. How many, how many, you know, creators, TV show personalities, different things along those lines have pushed it so far to, to be that guy and to be the hero. Well, we as hunters are still watching them too. And so, you know, how we separate this out in terms of I honestly see absolutely nothing wrong with antler scoring. I see absolutely nothing wrong with the pursuit of a mature deer extending out your season. Um, you know, but you need to frame it like that. You don't, don't, I only shoot, you know, 170 pluses that that's, we're doing that to ourselves and that's not the scoring system. That's our emphasis. And so, you know, anytime I get to have a conversation, um, you know, with anyone. I mean, that's why I came up to you. I saw your, your, your article on the antler scoring. I'm like, man, he's got some good points, but there's also some counterpoints here. Let's have this discussion. 
you know, let's make ourselves better as a community. And that's my number one concern. I, I personally, I think if Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young ceased keeping records tomorrow, both organizations would continue. I don't think it would do a darn thing, though, because there's a system and people are still going to measure antlers. And then there's just one less referee in there. So abandoning it, I don't think does us any good either. It's already been it's already been done. We've put our emphasis on a number and not the experience. Um, you know, that that's my concern. That That's what I, I lay awake staring at the ceiling at night thinking about how do I address this? you know, to maintain our conservation successes that we work so hard to get into the future. Yeah. What do you think about that, John? Um, I, I don't think it should be about the score. I don't think it should be about the competition. I think the, the hunters out there that use it as a measuring tool, just to one up uh, are, uh, you know, just, that's their priority. It, this is an emotional issue for them and a value-based judgment on how they want to recognize that animal. Uh, it worries me. I think it's de- divisive. I am very pro-scoring for the reasons that I have mentioned in the last hour. But I think we've got to be careful. I, I read your article and I wondered if this was a discussion we would have had 10 years ago or 15 years ago um, before everyone was so connected and so uh, the ability to comment on everything was a bit more restrictive if you were writing a letter to the editor of Field and Stream or Outdoor Life or something about that when a score was mentioned. I mean, now it's all in real time. And so it worries me emphasizing the score and nothing else. I think it's, it's going to take away from what this was put in place to do and take away from the potential that it has. And, and so um, that will fall on deaf ears to some hunters. I recognize that fully, and that's just my personal perspective. So, so this is a question that I have discussed with with all of our past uh, guests within this little mini series. Um, I think a lot of us have similar worries and concerns, similar to what the both of you just uh, described. But the question is always. But what do we do about it? Mm-hmm. Because because I think you mentioned this earlier, Justin, right? The content that people click on, the content that people want to watch on YouTube or see on Instagram or read from the Boone and Crockett Club, you know, it's maybe 5% of the people will read the article about the conservation story related to this data, but a million people will read the article about the new world record. Um, they'll the, everybody will click the YouTube thumbnail with the 270 inch double drop tine mega giant, right? Um, so the question is like, how, how do we change this thing that just is, I guess, is human nature related to some degree, um, also cultural inertia? Um, if we all know that there's something. I don't know if toxic's the right word, but but something that seems um, unhealthy within it. If we know there's something there, what kinds of things can we tangibly do as individuals or as leaders within this community or communicators or, or whatever role anyone listening plays within this hunting co- community? Um, what kinds of things would the two of you suggest an individual do to be a part of changing this trend in a little bit more positive a direction? I think individuals need to be prepared to speak up. Yeah. I mean, hopefully we could generate some, some momentum through our discussion today. And if people understand this is not a tool to figure out how much you can brag about or how much attention or clicks or whatever you can get, but the real meaning of why we're taking these measurements. And if somebody sees that there's a new whatever record it might be for whatever species, emphasize that that's just one data point. And that's interesting, and we can appreciate that animal. And I'll see uh, any number of articles in the local paper where angler cats, catches a record fish of whatever kind. And yeah, you click on it. It's interesting to know. But communicating why we're taking these messages, I mean, measure measurements and how to message it to the wider community, I think is is a great first step what you're doing today. 
What do you think, Justin? I, you know, I, I, I've spent my time in the nonprofit world. You know, do do the words of Roosevelt: do what what you can with what you have where you're at. You know, get on that advisory committee in your local area. Um, you know, get involved with a local conservation group, depending on what it may be. Get involved at a national level. Um, you know, somebody has a desire to learn about hunting, or maybe they don't like wild game. Man, invite them over. Tell the tell that conservation story. And I think if if you if you put it out there enough, and you have enough people that you kind of bring bring along with you, and say, hey, you know, if you're going to be a hunter, I think this is part of it too. Not just going out and filling the freezer, or hanging the buck on the wall. You know, do a game feed. Invite some friends over that maybe don't understand it, and show them this type of thing. You know, I again, ground up type thing. I mean, that's the that's what the the conservation movement always was. That's what P and Y was. That's what B and C was. You know, spread your influence as far as you can, and and that's how I think we combat this. You know, I mean, if somebody's all excited about uh, you know that giant deer that they killed, and then they mention, well, I didn't get to cutting it up because I was too busy driving it around town. I mean, don't lose a friendship over it, but maybe chastise them a bit of like, hey, man, you're you're kind of minimizing it to one thing. You know, we're, I mean, I, I always joke, yeah, man, I love I love hunting meat, but I also like something to hang my hats on. You know, everything, every part of that freaking animal should be utilized and respected. You know, and I don't care if you're minimizing it to just the meat or just the antlers or just any one thing. That's bad, and. And as hunters, we need we need to take we need to take pride in every single thing that has to do with that the the exercising, the preparing, the, the shooting of, of the bow year round, you know, all that stuff. That's how we fight this. We show that we were brought here by conservation minded people, and we're going to do our part to ensure that that conservation mindset continues, and we don't get wrapped up in the commercial commercialization of killing the biggest at the furthest distance as quick as possible. Yeah. So I, I find myself at a fork in the road uh, because something you just said there, Justin, uh, brings to mind another kind of half of this whole cultural discussion that I've been having over the last few weeks. Um, you said something on the lines of, you know, whether you can kill a deer from as far away or as fast as possible. Right. And, and when I hear that, I'm thinking all of these changes in technology and how that's impacting how we hunt. Um, whether that be the, the long distance shooting craze, whether that be thermal optics, live streaming cell cameras, drones being used, all of these electronic optics that allow you to range find and, and have all your adjustments made automatically for you. There, there's so many things changing right now um, that are impacting really what hunting is. And I have so many questions, so many concerns about that. Uh, and I think a lot of hunters do. But at the same time, there's this whole pushback on that from within the hunting community, which is anytime somebody says, well, I don't know about this technology or I don't know about this thing or that thing, the automatic response is you're tearing down others in the hunting community. You're dividing the hunting community. You shouldn't do that at all. Everything should be okay as long as it's legal. Um, what is your thought on the trends as we see them now with technology and gear, Justin? I'm sure this is something that you know you're discussing at Boone and Crockett on the Ethics Committee a lot, and I'm sure at PNY you're thinking about it a lot. Um, how are you individually, and how is PNY as an organization thinking about the? what seems like a, a rampant speed up of the advance of technology and how it's impacting hunting. You know, and it, it, it is, and it, it's realistically, you know, put this into context. It feels like, yeah, we're getting a, a ton of stuff thrown at us right now. Um, but this, this idea of technology and giving the animal an opportunity to, to win for lack of a better term. I mean, that is the root of fair chase. The animal has the, has a fair chance to to come out victorious in in the in the competition between hun, hunter and hunted, right? Um, you know, this goes back the, the very first time this came up was when Boone and Crockett required fair chase was the '60s with the prevalence of airplane usage in Alaska for scouting, 
And that was the first time that the organization was like, man, that could get real bad if people just flew around, spotted them from the air, landed and shot them. Like that's, that's no good. Like that, that's not giving the animal a chance to escape or you know, evade hunters. And obviously we've come further and further along and, and technology is not inherently the devil. I mean, there's, there's things that we have now that, that I would argue have, have made us more ethical hunters, more legal hunters. You know, now I know exactly where I'm standing. I, I, I can, you know, I can figure stuff out that before like, okay, well, best guess, I'm pretty sure that fence line separates this and this. So that type of thing I think is good, but what we need to do, and this is the discussions that are had with, with both Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett, obviously a little bit different in terms of Pope and Young's mission is promotion of archery. And they have defined archery as a vertical bow. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a valid method of harvest. That's why we were started was to prove it was. And so they have a little bit tighter focus on looking at some of the technologies. Is this technology going to be detrimental to the wildlife or does this make a bow no longer a bow? Right. So there is some differences there between the two groups, but I mean, at the end of the day, like, you're not supposed to always be successful. Hunting is not supposed to have a predetermined outcome. Like, you know, I mean, those of us that have been doing it forever, like what, what relives in your head again and again, the time you made a mistake, the time that big buck winded you, the time you moved when you shouldn't have, you tried to draw and he busted you, you know, those failures are the ones that are burned into your head and make you a better hunter. And when we start, pushing technology to, well, he can't smell me now because I don't have to go into that bedding area for six months because I have a cellular trail camera. Yes, it's made it easier. Yes, the deer's not as disturbed. I, I understand those arguments, but as a hunter, isn't that part of the game of sneaking in there, finding that bedding area and doing all that without relying on technology? And it's a very, it's a very volatile debate. I mean, what's, what's inappropriate to me to the next game, my next guy might just be fine. And so both organizations find ourselves in this situation where we're trying to play referee, but trying to get it to a higher level. What we found is addressing each technology one by one, in essence, we're picking winners and losers of companies, which is never what this was supposed to be doing. Not like oh, they invested this much, but we don't think this is fair chase. That's, that's not at all what any of these groups are ever trying to say. So we're trying to say from a higher level, what, what is the line that cross, that, 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 that the technology crosses that makes it unfair? Um, one that comes up with BNC a lot, is it giving me the location of game electronically that I wouldn't have got otherwise? Uh, think drones. Think um, some states now through freedom of information, you have to release GPS coordinates, real-time GPS coordinates of where a herd of elk is and caller data, they have to release that. You're now getting that actual location of the animal. And so how do we make these high level rules that folks can look at and say, you know, is this crossing the line? And the answer is there's not a definitive line. That's why Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young take so much heat is we're trying to find that gray line and, and listen to everybody's perspective. And we're the ones that finally sometimes have to say, no, nah, man, that's just too far. And we have to say it. Yeah. John, what, what do you feel on this topic personally? It worries me. I mean, I agree with Justin and innovation is coming and, and this is so tied to personal ethics and values and priorities that it's, it's, an individual's decision what they think crosses an ethical line when it comes down to it. And so for some people, um, it, it's no big deal for me. I think that um, that some of this new technology is just making it too uh, efficient to harvest game. From a population level among hunters, I mean, one thing that worries me is I hunt throughout the West. Uh, you look at species like mule deer and elk where units will have however many tags allocated, the game agencies are buffering where the, that allocation is not assuming 100% success among hunters. 
if these new technologies come in and boost success that high, then tag allocation for all the rest of us who are not using those technologies may be reduced. And so it may end up biting us in the butt and making that tag more difficult to draw. Um, I've heard that animals will evolve and, you know, just like you know, mallards now get a spinning wind decoy a bit more than they did 20 years ago, stuff like thermal units, drones, uh, that's a, uh, that's a pretty tricky thing to evolve <laughs> to respond to for a bull elk, and so uh, I don't yeah. I don't see that happening. Yeah. So so one idea that I've had, and it and it it might be pie in the sky and Pollyanna. So I guess what I'm looking for here is uh, is like a BS check from the two of you, if you think anybody would go for this. Um, but but when it comes to this whole technology thing. Right. As we've we've all kind of admitted, it's it's very personal. It's very subjective. Everyone's going to draw a line in the sand in a different place. And that is that's by the nature of what ethics are. Right. We all have a different um, comfort level with different things. But it seems like there are some general lines where you start getting closer and closer to. And, and most folks start feeling like ah, uh, there's something going on here. So there's there's two hypothetical ways you could deal with something like this. There's the there's the way of, you know, using the stick and saying we're going to ban this thing or we're going to regulate this thing or we are going to outlaw this thing or or say this thing you know can't be allowed in the record books, etc. On the flip side, there's this alternative way which could be promoting the alternative, um, or or popularizing. Um, the antithesis. So one thought I had is like, so for me, one of my lines in the sand is with cell cameras. Um, I've always thought that like real time data is a line too far for me. So I personally set a 24 hour delay on all cell cameras so that I'm a full 24 hours removed from any knowledge that I gain through that technology. Um, and maybe even that's too much. But right now, that's where I personally have drawn my line. And I have thought, what if you could establish some kind of light line like that, where it's like a, a 24-hour delay on a trail camera, for example, would get that trail camera a fair chase certification from the Boone and Crockett Club or from Pope and Young. And that could be like a stamp, like a badge of honor that a company could use to help market their product. Or what if we had a, I don't know what another example would be, um, but another one of these possible game changers, I don't know, I, for lack of a better, more thought on this, we'll stick with the trail mm -hmm. camera example. Um, what if there's something like that where we could vote with our dollars, hunters could say like, hey, we do want to promote this idea of keeping things you know, not always getting easier, but actually we want to tap the brakes on this thing and we want to show our that desire we have by voting with our dollars for the things that actually make it harder. Yeah. Um, is that the kind of thing that would ever work? Is that an idea? Like, God, I would buy all fair chase certified cell cameras. And then I could be like, Hey, I, yeah, I still get to enjoy some benefits of this technology, but I am, you know, I am by, by, by the boon of the technology itself limited to not giving into the temptation of using everything. Um, is that kind of thing a model maybe that could work in the future with other technologies as we go forward? Am I onto something you know, or is this I, crazy? I completely agreed with you. And back before the, uh, the, the, the cellular camera got the, the following that it had and, you know, 80% of them went that way. You know, I, I presented that to some companies and I said, Hey man, what if we, what if we put a, a fair chase certified mark on that? And there wasn't, from the industry, the companies I talked to at the time didn't really gravitate towards that. It didn't, it didn't have the appeal that they wanted it to. Now that goes back to what we talked about in scoring and the adoption of, you know, everybody taking part in this record book. You know, a, a component of that is an ethical piece. All these animals have to be taken in fair chase. They do have you do have to say, I took them within these rules which is the rules we're making. And so again, it's just buy-in. I mean, I would, I'd love to go to a company and say, Hey, let's, let's cross promote something. Um, I, I've reached out to some trail cam companies and 
some other technologies, my thought has been, hey, what if we come out with the company saying, yes, this technology is available. Yes, it can be used correctly, but also it could be used incorrectly. And if that's said jointly by the producer and the folks using it, does that not lend some credibility to like, hey, man, let's let's back it down a little bit on this thermal usage, you know, looking over an entire canyon. Like, yeah, you can use it at night. It's good for predator control. It's, you know, you could use it here appropriately, but you could also abuse this. That way you're not telling people like you can't do this, but you are saying like, hey, for the good of hunting, for the survival of species, like there is a way we need to conduct ourselves to give the animals a chance to win. And then we also need to, you know, and I'm guilty of it too. Don't post on, you know, Facebook, oh, I failed, tag soup this year. Man, we, we got to be okay with that. Failure because you tried to make it too hard is just as admirable as success. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that idea of, um, you know, I, I think I think there's a business opportunity for companies out there to lean into this. And there's a, there's a, there's a story that will sell, that will sell products. I really do believe it. Not everybody in the hunting world wants, uh, the next big technology thing. And even though I know the dollars tell otherwise, I, I, I really do believe there's something here that someone could take advantage of. Um, but it's, uh, not, it's above my pay grade, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, do you have any comments on that, John? I'd love to see it work. I- I mean, I think you're right that it would apply to some people and make things emit improvement, even if a handful of people switch to that more fair chase approach. That's good for hunting. That's good for all of us. But there's there's going to be hunters out there who are hunting for Instagram and by any means necessary. And I think that that, that will be the tough market to reach. I like the idea. So I'm reluctant. <laughs> well, I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that somebody at some company is listening and willing to take a risk. <laughs> I hope so too. Take a chance, guys. Bye-bye. Take a chance. Um, all right. Well, I think we could continue for two more <laughs> hours down the road of, of all of these questions and worries, which I'm guilty of sometimes doing. I'm going to try to, to, to save us from that now. Uh, by offering us an off ramp, is there any any other resource, whether it be a book or a documentary or an online essay or something that either one of you have found inspiration from or have learned from or could see value in someone today? checking out as a kind of uh, coda to what we've talked about today. Is there any favorite resource or recommend recommendation you could share with folks listening um, related to the topics we've covered today, whether that be the history of the scoring system or conservation and citizen science or fair chase or the, the use or moderation of technology, any of these things we've covered. Um, is there anything that comes to mind that we uh, maybe should check out? You know what, really? Justin, I don't know if, or if either one of you yeah, have one. If it really depends on how far, you know, how, how deep that rabbit hole you want to go. Um, there's some tremendous reading. Um, the, uh, the, the, the biography of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, what, what I found super intriguing was that his uncle actually started in fisheries. So a lot of our conservation movement originally was based off of uh, the hatchery model. Um, you know, that, that one's like the ultimate, like trying to answer the question of how do we get where we were? How did, you know, how did this land just straight for technology? We just, um, Boone and Crockett and the ethics committee just did a fair chase module for part of the NRA Hunter Ed. You can go on to their, um, NRA's platform, their Hunter education platform. There's a fair chase module. That's kind of a 201 level. Um, you know, maybe you've got a, you know, Teen to 20s, it's starting to get into this hunting, really starting to take it. We tried to um, dedicate that fair chase messaging to that demographic. Um, Jim Posowitz has a book, Beyond Fair Chase. Um, the pause was awesome. It's great. You know, you're probably not going to agree with everything he wrote, but he brings up some very good questions. If you really want to question this idea of fair chase and what is and isn't okay, um, 
you know, like I said, it, it, it just depends on the level of engagement and both clubs' websites. I mean, there's a there's a fair chase essay that Boone and Crockett did that kind of looks at some situations. Pope and Young has position statements on sites and definition of a bow. Uh, there, there's there's a ton out there. Um, do you have any favorites, John? I'm going to take the low-hanging fruit and say every hunter should read a Sand County Almanac by <laughs> Aldo Leopold. Yes. And if you're only going to pick one thing within that book, read Think Like a Mountain. And I think that's a good way to yeah. stay grounded and see how far this wildlife conservation, wildlife management movement has come. And uh, I, I think that's good for everybody to take to the duck blind, to the deer stand, read in the off season. It's just, it's, it'll keep us all looking in the right direction. Yeah. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with you on that one. Um, Justin, I want to give you an opportunity for the last word just to plug uh, Pope and Young, if you'd like, and give folks explicit directions on the URL, um, on any specific actions you'd like them to take. Uh, you know, something we maybe should have covered but didn't um, would even be a, a walkthrough of exactly what goes into making a submission to Pope and Young. Um, if you want to tackle any one of those, you're welcome to. You've yeah, no, I mean, go, go to the website, pope, have, pope young.org. Um, there's, there's membership options there. We'd love to have you as a member. We'd love to have an entry. Um, there's a list of all the official measures. You know, if you're in an area that there's not a lot of official measures, we'd love to have you fill out one of those online applications and maybe get involved as a, as a volunteer for us scoring. Um, 2025, we're doing a big convention in uh, Glendale, Arizona, April 9 through 12. We'd love to have you come out, check out our convention. Um, there'll be, you know, seminars on these topics. You know, maybe, maybe Mark would be nice enough to come out and talk to us out there. We'll see. Hit him up for that. But, um, you know, anywhere you can get involved, we'd love to have you. And the website's a great place to start. And uh, there's all kinds of different links depending on, you know, conservation, whatever you want to go down. That's that's the best place to start. And we'd love love to have you in our ranks. And, you know, we talk a lot about the future, man. Get involved. Help, you know, help me do my job. Be one of the voices in the organization that rises up and helps direct our future. Love it. All right, gentlemen. Justin, John, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. Thank you. All right. And that's a wrap. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you for being a part of this community. Until next time, stay wired to hunt.